afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. City Club is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm Felisa Hagen, Secretary of the City Club Board of Governors. Members and guests are gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening on OPB and watching on Portland Community Media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media sponsors enable us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsored, sponsors are continued AARP of Oregon, McKinley Irvin, Irabola Renewables, Providence Health and Services, Uber, and we'd like to welcome a new sponsor this week, Airbnb. Please join me in showing your appreciation for all of them. At next week's Friday Forum, we will present part one of a two-part series on housing. Part one is entitled, Is Portland Facing a Rental State of Emergency? We'll include a panel with Israel Baer, Executive Director of Street Roots, Eli Spivak, founder of Orange Splot, and Nolan Leinhart, Director of Planning and Urban Design for ZGF Architects. We will also hear remarks from the new Portland Housing Director, Kurt Krieger. Please join us here at the Sentinel for this important topic. You can learn more about the City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, we'll be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along or join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. Later in today's program, Anna Griffin will facilitate a Q&A session with those live in the audience. Asking questions at the microphone is a privilege of City Club membership, but anyone in the live audience here at the Sentinel may write a question on one of the index cards found at the center of your tables. Hold the card up high and City Club staff will collect them before or during Q&A session. And now for today's program. By state law, every six years, the Metro Council reviews the land supply for the next 20 years and if necessary, adjust the, urban, the region's urban growth boundary to meet anticipated housing and employment land needs. The council will vote on a new three-year extension in November, following a period for public input. Metro Council President Tom Hughes will speak to the issues involved and then engage in a conversation with Oregonians Anna Griffin about the vote and more importantly, what's next for the region's growth. Let's welcome Metro President Tom Hughes. Well, thank you, Felicia. Uh, I want to uh, thank the City Club for inviting me today and you all for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to come today. And I want to particularly recognize uh, three of my counselor uh, colleagues who uh, had a day free from listening to me talk about things and yet chose to show up anyway. Uh, Craig Dirksen, uh, Sam Chase, and a special thanks to, uh, to Bob Stacy, who is here on his birthday. So. Uh, that's uh, So we are at the moment, the four of us and our three colleagues, wrestling with the issue of uh, what to do about setting the boundary uh, in, into which Portland will uh, grow, we believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of 400,000 new residents over the next 20 years. There are people who say, well, why do we grow at all? Why don't we just not grow? Why don't we adopt policies that would discourage growth, that would prevent people from coming? Uh, and the answer to that is relatively simple. First of all, it's difficult to do that. Places that have done that have found, among other things, that what happens is the price to live in those communities goes sky high. Uh, but, uh, th but on the other hand, there isn't much going on in those communities by way of economic life anyway, so nobody much wants to go there. Uh, we have been uh, a, a region that has uh, enjoyed uh, fairly consistent economic growth, uh, and part of that, at least, in, is, is, is either preceded by or uh, followed by uh, substantial uh, growth in our population. To that end, in 1995, we adopted uh, a, 
a policy called the 2040 plan. Looking forward actually to 2040, uh, we started in, in uh, 1990. Uh, we looking forward to 2040 in terms of what was the what was this area going to look like uh, as we grew over that 50 year period of time. Uh, we are now about halfway uh, towards that goal, uh, and uh, we're about 20 years ahead of the of the planning frame that we use uh, to project what for uh, what we need for housing. Uh, manufacturing jobs and other em uh, employment areas uh, over the next 20 years. So let's look back for a second at 20 years to give you an idea of what that timing frame looks like. Uh, so in 1995, Bill Gates introduced uh, Windows 95 and, uh, and sort of revolutionized uh, the, the tech industry. Uh, Toy Story was the first digitalized uh, feature film that was ever introduced. Some of you will remember this, many of you may not. Uh, modems actually made a noise when you connected uh, to the internet. Uh, and uh, the world began fiddling around with this thing called the World Wide Web. Uh, within Portland, the Pearl District uh, had yet to take off. There were about a thousand residents in the Pearl District, which was largely rail yards and old warehouses. Today there's about 6,000 people living there. Uh, as some of you know, my, uh, my roots are in Hillsboro, where I was mayor for a while. And uh, at the t in 1995, Hillsboro had a population of about, uh, about 65,000, and it is now approaching 100,000 in the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, census. Uh, Sherwood, a city of about, uh, is now a city of about 20,000. Back in 1995, was about 5,000. So if you look at a 20-year planning framework, how do you plan uh, to accommodate those kinds of changes? How do you predict that a Sherwood is going to go from 5 to 20, for example, uh, and, uh, and provide for uh, the services and the uh, the, the, just to make the land available for that to happen. Uh, so we have uh, looked at that problem for a very long time now. Interestingly enough, I think we're still talking about the same things that we were talking about back in 1995. In 1995, by the way, I was on the Hillsborough Planning Commission, and so I wasn't altogether uh, absent from the discussion, but I certainly didn't play this, the kind of role that I'm playing now. Uh, but we were still talking about the same things, growth and sprawl. Uh, how do we grow and not sprawl as we had seen other regions in the, in the country uh, suffer under, uh, under growth? Uh, the folk, the young people in Orange County probably have to study the history of their area in order to find out why it's called Orange County because uh, they haven't been around to see the orange grows. Uh, that those of us who got treated to a trip to Disneyland in our youth uh, actually remember the orange, orange groves around Anaheim as we went down there. Uh, but we, we determined then that we didn't want to be that, that we wanted to be something uh, unique, uh, something uniquely Oregonian. Uh, and of course, part of that, sometimes that led to a a sort of an anti-outsider point of view. Let's not let anybody in. Uh, the Tom McCall famous statement, uh, visit but don't stay, uh, was sort of the, the uh, theory at the time. Uh, and if you will remember back, what that did was it generated a tremendous desire of people to come here because this was this odd place that didn't want them to come. And so, uh, you know, let's go find out what the secret was. So in order to, uh, but, but among other things, in order to uh, try to get a handle on that growth, to preserve farm and forest land, to keep that farm and forest land in relatively close proximity to urban, uh, to urban areas, uh, we establish an urban growth boundary. Every city in the state of Oregon has an urban growth boundary. The difference in the Portland metro area is that the 25 cities in the Portland metro area all have a common urban growth boundary, and that urban growth boundary 
unlike the other city's boundaries, which are set by the city government, is that boundary, our boundary is set by Metro. And so we have to work on uh, deciding whether or not, or and how much and where, to expand the urban growth boundary. That process started for us about three years ago. Uh, and the very first thing that we have to do in order to arrive at that, uh, at that answer is to uh, do some projections on population growth. Uh, what we learned a few, a few cycles ago was that uh, we are better off not picking a number, but rather doing a range of possibilities for population growth, and then, at, and then talk about what, that, what, what the effect on the urban growth boundary would be depending on where on the range we, we hit. Uh, obviously, the midpoint on the range is the most statistically most likely to occur, and so uh, a couple of weeks ago, the council uh, determined that that was where we want to come down on the population growth. So, so the question then is, how much do we need in the way of land for housing? How much do we need in the way of land for industrial growth? How much do we need in, in commercial uh, gr development? Uh, and is that land available within the current urban growth boundary? Uh, so we began to uh, have conversations with our local, uh, with our, our local jurisdictions. We went out to all 25 cities and three counties and said, sat down with them, our staff did, sat down with them, went over their comprehensive plan, uh, had them identify for us developable acreage within their jurisdiction, talk a little bit about what the constraints were on that developable acreage, uh, so that we got, uh, our staff got a really composite picture of what the land availability was like in the region. Uh, then we uh, take a relatively complex uh, but well-reviewed uh, economic model, and we model what we think the economy is going to do over the next 20 years against th those comprehensive plans. So it sounds complex and, and actually is way above my pay grade, but, uh, but what, what it comes down to are questions like this. If, if you wonder whether or not there is going to be, what the balance between multifamily and single family is going to be, project what that balance is going to be, and then look at where there is land zoned to accommodate that market. And so uh, one of the things that happens as a result of doing that is it would appear that a substantial amount of the growth that's going to take place is going to take place within the city limits of Portland simply because Portland has more land zoned for multifamily development than some of the uh, other jurisdictions in the region do. That, by the way, is not an urban suburban thing as much as it simply is where the leadership of those cities have gone. So, for example, Hillsboro uh, has a substantial amount of, uh, of, of uh, well, an industrial land, first of all, but also high uh, high capacity uh, multifamily residential in areas like Orenco Station and uh, Amber Glen. Amber Glen, you won't be familiar with because it hasn't really begun to happen yet, but Orenco Station is going great guns and, uh, and looks like the market is driving what the city of Hillsborough said they wanted to have happen in Orenco. Just as the market appears to be driving what the city of Portland said they wanted to happen in the Lloyd District, uh, in the Central East Side, those areas are, are uh, hot markets right now, uh, and they are really developing rapidly. Our numbers project that that, that that trend will continue for the life of the 20 years that we're, that we're studying. The result of that is that when we look at that model, it leads us to the conclusion that we no longer, we don't have a need to expand the urban growth boundary. Uh, we have adequate supplies of land both for housing uh, and for industrial and, and, and other economic growth. Uh, so we can grow the houses and the jobs within the urban growth boundary over the next uh, 20 years without expanding the urban growth boundary. Now, 
Having said that, we're all a little nervous about those projections. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons for that that you have to be aware of is that Metro has never, uh, has never not expanded the urban growth boundary. So in all of the, in all of the urban growth boundary uh, decisions that we've made in the past as an agency, the decision always was to expand the urban growth boundary somewhat. And so to come up, or to, to have uh, a result that says we don't have to expand the urban growth boundary at all is a little unusual for us. And part of that is because we believe that there are unusual demographic changes taking place in society that probably are gonna be long term. Uh, and so uh, we think going forward that we're gonna see dramatic changes in, uh, in terms of what this area is gonna look like, particularly with that balance between multifamily and single family. Portland right now, the Portland area, for example, is about 70-30, so about 70% is, is single family, 30% is multifamily. We think that in 2035, that will have shifted to about a 60-40 mix. So 60% will be single family, 40% will be multifamily. And that's a significant shift and a significant amount of multifamily that uh, would be constructed over the next few years uh, in, in order to do that. Uh, so as we go forward, uh, we think that a handful uh, of really dynamic neighborhoods uh, are really gonna take off. So the Lloyd, the Lloyd District, as I mentioned before, uh, where I work, uh, if you look out the window, you can see my, you know, 13 cranes uh, building about three or somewhere between three or 4,000 units of multifamily housing in that district, which has quite frankly been an, an underachieving district uh, economically in the past. Uh, I mentioned Orenco Station. Uh, there, are other, there are other developments around the region that are beginning to take off. And other things that cities had, had always held as aspirational goals that are beginning to happen in part because of this market change. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to go to downtown Milwaukee recently, uh, take a visit out to Milwaukee and see what kinds of economic changes are taking place in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, and you'll find a community that is benefiting from uh, uh, an increase in vibrancy and uh, they're making some significant changes that will, that will catch that wave, I think, into the future. Uh, part of what's happening, by the way, is that many of us who are boomers uh, are beginning to tire of our uh, single family home with, uh, with a lawn that we have to either mow or have mowed, uh, having had my my one grandchild is now in college, so it's very hard to get my lawn mowed anymore. Uh, not that it was easy when he was home, but, uh, but it is even harder now. Uh, and so, you know, like many other baby boomers, my wife and I have talked recently about the prospect of moving. And if we were to move, uh, it wouldn't be into another single family home. It would be probably into some multifamily complex someplace, either a senior living or or just another, or, or just an apartment. Uh, and many of us are doing that. I'm, we're not alone in, in thinking about that. It, in those of you who have followed or studied uh, demographics for a long time are aware of the fact that the baby boomers are one of the largest generations to ever come through uh, that curve. And so whatever we do has profound impact on economic forces. So the fact that that probably about the same percentage of us are now beginning to look for multifamily experiences. We just are a lot more, there's a lot more of us doing that than with other generations. So there is this demand at the senior level for more multifamily. On the other hand, baby boomers, uh, I'm sorry, not baby boomers, but millennials are, are, are different from us in a number of ways. Some, in some ways, they're very similar to us. We believe that when baby boomers, hello, when millennials start uh, having families, 
they too will begin to desire to move into single family homes. But what we're noticing about them from a demographic standpoint is that is happening to them much later in their lives than it is now, uh, than it was with our generation, than it was with the generations that have come between us. And so, again, we think that trend will continue as that cohort marches into the e economic life of the country and that that will, not, will show a downturn, immediate downturn in the demand for single family houses. And again, an uptick as fewer of them leave their multifamily existence. Uh, you know, one of the things, even, even when they do have families, some of you may remember the discussion that took place uh, around the Pearl District that Portland Public always said, well, we don't need to build a school in the Pearl District because those folks won't have kids, and once they have kids, they'll move out into the suburbs. They are now talking about how do we retrofit the Pearl with a school because they have a significant number of school-age kids living in the Pearl in those high-rise apartments that now, that now they're beginning to contemplate a school. And so those kinds of changes, we think, are going to produce what, uh, what we're seeing in terms of more shift towards multifamily and therefore uh, not, uh, and so therefore the land that we have within the urban growth boundary should be sufficient to meet the capacity needs uh, for the region until 2035. Uh, we're nervous enough about that though that our proposal is that we start, we, we start the process of looking at that again sooner rather than later. So we are required by law to do it, actually the, the law changed, so we're now required by law to do it every five years. Uh, we think that we need to start uh, almost as soon as this one is done, beginning to gather the information because we want to see if it makes any difference the further we get away from the recession. So the recession may have altered our numbers somewhat in ways that we don't completely understand. And so two or three years later, we may be able to see some glimmer of a different direction than we thought that was going to go. Uh, our goal, though, has been always to work with our local partners uh, to, uh, to build our plans off of their plans uh, and to, uh, to model them as close to reality uh, as we can. We constantly check our models against other professionals to make sure that they're valid. Uh, and we think that what we've got is the most valid proposal. So proceeding from here, the council uh, last night uh, took the, opened the first hearing uh, on the uh, COOs, our, our chief operating officers, recommendation that we not expand the urban growth boundary. Uh, we, we didn't have much uh, hearing, much uh, testimony last night. We will have two other hearings and then sometime in November the council will vote as to whether to accept that report and at that point then by the end of the year we will, if we accept the report by the end of the year we will then uh, declare that this process is over and there, that there will not be an expansion of the urban growth boundary. Now, oddly, obviously, I should say, not oddly, but obviously, uh, that has created a, uh, a bit of controversy. And so uh, it is uh, around that controversy, I suspect that we may see some questions this afternoon. Uh, but I'm, and I'm going to uh, wait for those questions and answer them as they come up. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your uh, listening to this uh, dialogue. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am Anna Griffin with The Oregonian and OregonLive.com, and I am here at the Portland City Club's Friday Forum. We're going to talk about the urban growth boundary and what the region is going to look like with Tom Hughes, president of the Metro Council. Hi, Tom. Hi, Anna. Um, the, the first question I have is affordability is the paramount issue facing this region today, whether we are talking about homelessness among the poorest of the poor, the working class being priced out of the rental market, or this wave of demolitions to make way for infill in some of our more historic upscale neighborhoods. The city of Portland gets most of the heat for not doing things to stop a housing crisis, but I wonder what is Metro's role in this? And are there things looking back over the past few years that you guys 
didn't do that maybe you should have? Well, um, you know, affordability is, is a fairly complex issue, uh, and there's a number of elements to it. One of those elements we, we know is the price of land. Uh, and so the system that we have evolved uh, has a tendency to potentially impact the price of land, obviously, uh, if you limit the supply. So part of the reason why we do this periodically is to make sure that the, uh, the, the impact on the price of land is, um, is minimal. Uh, I, you know, in terms of what we have, what we did in the past that that might may, might be a mistake, I I think that um, that the land use system itself contributes marginally uh, to the the problem, the crisis with uh, affordability, uh, and I think going forward, uh, it it will it will uh, even be more marginal. For example, some of the data that uh, that our projections show is that 60 percent of the households that'll be moving into Portland, uh, in the Portland area in the next 20 years will be uh, two and three member households and that they will have uh, an average uh, family, an, an average household income of 25 to $35,000. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that, that is hardly enough to, to get affordable housing. I mean, that when we talk about housing affordability, it is that uh, blue collar working class housing affordability where we, I think we really have a, a crisis that's a little bit hidden. So I mean, we, we, we know that the people who are desperately poor uh, and that we see uh, on every uh, high, freeway interchange in the area, that, that they have a housing crisis. We understand that. Uh, I think it's harder to understand the struggle that a lot of young uh, working class kids are going through right now uh, just to keep their, you know, just to keep houses over their heads. Uh, and, and so we're, we're going to start, a, uh, we put some money into uh, some staff folk uh, to begin to see about coordinating some sort of an effort around the region to try to address that issue. Uh, and we're really in the early days of that. Of that. Let's, let's go back for a second and talk more specifically about the urban growth boundary. It raises real estate prices to limit supply, right? You know, uh, it raises land prices. And I think that the difference between raising land prices and raising ho housing prices are two different things. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, and, and we, we won't know yet for sure, but the developments that I'm from away. So if you look at the North Bethany development, uh, they're building single family houses and I'm going to guess that they're selling in the $350,000, $400,000 range. Uh, those folks wound up paying about $250,000 an acre for land. So divide that by eight, and it gives you sort of what the land costs were. South Hillsboro is about to come on the market. My guess is that a house in South Hillsboro will range somewhere a little bit less than 350,000, but somewhere between 300 and 350,000. Those folks paid $17,000 an acre for their land prices. And yet the prices of the houses don't really reflect the difference in the land cost. Uh, so what I'm, and I guess what I'm saying is that it is, it is more complex. Uh, I, I think uh, cities, counties, and even Metro add to the cost of housing almost more through the regulatory and fee process than we do by uh, forcing up the price of land. So what do we do about that? About the fees? Yeah. Uh, you know, the difficulty of, well, because I can, I can be a little sanctimonious about it because we don't really charge a whole lot of fees and we don't issue permits. Uh, but. Uh, but I, and I understand what cities are going through trying because because th that growth demands some some uh, uh, cover, you know some I, uh, infrastructure, and in order to pay for the infrastructure, uh, you have to put that burden on somebody. And the choices, as you sit there as a city official, the choices are two: you can tax the people who are already here. 
uh, or you can tax the people who are coming. Uh, so you can charge it by uh, an increase in property tax, uh, which, which raises uh, the property tax on everybody, or you can uh, demand that it be charged as a system development charge and, uh, and be paid as people move in. Uh, it's very interesting because the people who aren't here yet are seldom likely to vote for your opponent. Uh, but I mean, and also you could argue that the people who already live here have already paid for those services, so you're asking them now to pay again. So there's, you know, there's a, a lot of different reasons why those fees are, are there, uh, and, and I do think that there needs to be at, at every level a constant um, searching as to whether or not those fees are absolutely necessary, and also on the part of all of us a discussion about what other sources of revenue could we find to build infrastructure. One of the fundamental principles of our land use system built into the urban growth boundary is that density is a good thing. And you talked about the increasing percentage, particularly in the city of Portland, of the population that's going to be choosing multifamily housing. And that, again, presumes that density is a good thing. What we're seeing in many neighborhoods across Portland, what we will soon be seeing in more neighborhoods across Beaverton, Hillsboro, Milwaukee, maybe even Oregon City, is conversations between existing residents and those folks who are coming about what neighborhoods look like. How do you convince people currently living in single family neighborhoods who like their tree-lined streets, who like being able to find parking, that density is a good thing? Well, again, uh, the density, um, it, it would be fairly easy, again, for me to just say, yeah, you know, that's really up to the local governments. <laughs> but, but, uh, but it is, it's a problem that impacts our ability to uh, uh, to gain support for uh, the kind of land use planning that we we really believe has created the vibrancy that we've got here. Um, I think quite just just my druthers and supported by I think the housing preference study that that a group of us did that a, a wide variety of housing types uh, is important for uh, the health of, of uh, a, a region and a neighborhood. Problem with that is that when you zone uh, a parcel for uh, residential, uh, quite often the market drives that residential at the most dense that it can possibly be. And so, uh, similarly, in, in terms of infill, uh, uh, a, a single family home on a large lot uh, may be a target for being torn down with two houses built in its place. So you still wind up with detached, with detached single family, uh, but it's way more crowded into neighborhoods that aren't used to that kind of crowding. I, again, what, one of the things we've explored, we explored out in Hillsborough were historic overlay zones uh, where we, where we uh, exempted particular neighborhoods from, uh, from density as long as they maintained their houses in the sort of the historic nature that they did, uh, and whatever infill there was, we required that it be consistent with the, with the houses. Uh, you know, I think there's some things like that that local governments can look at, but there is no silver bullet on that. One of the underlying principles of the land use system we have is that different communities will get along, that cities will work together, that regionalism will be something we embrace. Given that so many of these problems we face right now, affordability, protecting the environment by getting people out of their cars, figuring out where the jobs are going to go and how we track them are regional in nature. Given that, how do you solve the political problem as Clackamas County? <laughs> um, in 20 words or less. Is <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, uh, I, you know, I think that Clackamas County is, is uh, exhibit, or is, experiencing some of the struggles uh, and, and maybe uh, just the, the, the tip of an iceberg, uh, some, of the, some of the protests down at, at, at Portland City Hall of late about, uh, about infill uh, might indicate that there are Portlanders who don't want to engage in Portland creep. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I just think that it's, uh, 
it has become fashionable and political in, uh, in that particular jurisdiction to, um, to use Metro and Portland as, as a political whipping boy, and that seems to, it seems to be a, a successful thing to do. Interestingly enough, there are uh, cities in Clackamas County uh, that have uh, have really good leadership and very are very collaborative and work together really well, uh, and um, uh, so I think there's hope. There's hope for all of us. So, you know, as a region, we can't afford uh, we can't afford to have one county not achieving economically, and uh, and and the numbers in Clackamas County show that they do tag behind some of the rest of the region in terms of economic growth. And, and we really need to struggle and collaborate with them to, to close that gap so that uh, economic, uh, economic success goes to our, all parts of the region. Just a reminder, I am Anna Griffin from the Oregonian and OregonLive.com, and I'm here at City Club's Friday Forum talking about the urban growth boundary and the future of the region with Metro Council President Tom Hughes. You. One of, the, one of the points that Martha Bennett makes in, in her urban growth boundary report and with the recommendation not to expand it is that we have enough land already inside the boundary for the economic growth and the housing growth that we're going to need in the years to come. Are there, are there spots that you look at, particularly in terms of an economic development, that are just underutilized? Are there specific places that you look at and go, we need to be doing something right there? Well, we have a number of uh, we have a number of areas in the in the region that I think are being very uh, are very um, um, I'm very optimistic about uh, the you know the opening of the Orange Line down into Milwaukee has opened up uh, an interesting opportunity for an industrial area in North Milwaukee that I think is going to be really exciting uh, in part because if you if you kind of ask the question that some of us have started to ask, which is, so what impact is the night challenge going to have on the economy of the Portland area? Uh, what, we, what one would hope would happen is that the research being done up at OHSU will, will create or promote the creation of jobs uh, in allied industries uh, in close proximity to that research. First, the first place, obviously, that is that people hope it'll go is South Waterfront. Uh, how land prices in South Waterfront are a little steep, so you could walk across the Tillicum Bridge and be in Central East Side, where they aren't so steep. Uh, so we think that some of the some of the benefit is going to spill over into Central East Side. But then, if you want to do something bigger, there is a there is this industrial. Uh, area in North Milwaukee that is actually bigger than Ronler Acres out in Hillsboro, uh, that has um, that is not far from being shovel ready in terms of welcoming some of those companies that might be moving there, and they're a 25 minute uh, uh, orange line ride, ride away from the, catching the tram up to OHSU. So, um, so that's one area uh, uh, between Wilsonville and, and Tualatin, for example. There's a an area called Basalt Creek that I think uh, obviously offers some opportunity. Part of the problem there is there's a, a working gravel quarry right in the middle of it, but, uh, but as that begins to play out and as other inv investments are made in terms of transportation infrastructure, I think that will, be, will take off. Willamette Falls uh, Heritage Project, which we're working on with Oregon City and Clackamas County, is a great opportunity for us uh, to take advantage to one of the real gems in Oregon that almost no one ever sees, which is Willamette Falls, and we're going to do a public project of a, a walk around uh, where the old Blue Heron site used to be, uh, but there is a private developer that's going to develop the land where the mill used to be, and we think that that's going to offer us an opportunity for a bunch of jobs. So there's, there's a ton of that kind of stuff. There's still land out in Hillsboro. Beaverton's got sites. Uh, we really need to begin to uh, to work together as a region uh, through Greater Portland Inc. to figure out how to market those sites better. How has your perspective on the role of Metro and the challenges of regionalism changed since you got this job? Yeah, that's I keep, I keep getting that question asked 
uh, from folks at home too. Uh, well, they 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 have. They usually include Kool-Aid somewhere in that uh, in that discussion. Uh, well, you know, I, I as I have told them, I, you. I would, you'd have to have a pretty low opinion of me if I didn't change positions and not, uh, and not change my view of the way things work. Uh, also, I think, th I think that, that Metro has, over the last few years, and, and I will only take credit for the last little bit of it, uh, has sort of evolved into an agency that, that uh, is less likely to say, here's a problem, what regulations do we need to impose in order to solve that problem uh, to an agency that says, here's a problem, what is everybody in the region doing to try to solve this problem? And so let's ask them and then maybe sit down with everybody and share ideas and, and see if there isn't some sort of a regional, a regional solution to that. I think that that's a, a, a much healthier way to look at regionalism because the reality is, which I, I actually believed even when I was mayor of Hillsborough, but the reality is we all we all do better if we work together. Uh, and and interestingly enough, even though you know we're close enough to, know, to see where the where the warts and blemishes are, what, from the outside world we are viewed as a place who really gets it in terms of collaboration. That we are one of the most collaborative places. I mean, uh, uh, people people actually take tours to come here to study how how we do our collaborate uh, collaborative work and so I think you know those of us who are here have to kind of not be so hard on ourselves about being able to do that I mean there are some people who are easier to work with than others but for the most part everybody is interested in moving their jurisdiction ahead and almost everybody understands that we can do that better working together than we can working at odds with each other. You mentioned uh, what the Pearl District was 20 years ago, and I'm, I'm curious as you and your wife think about the future, I'm looking for a real estate tip here. Where are you gonna buy the condo? What is the next, what's the next Pearl? Yeah, you know, it's really, uh, it, it's really interesting. Uh, I, we uh, decided that we were gonna, uh, we were gonna move into uh, an apartment on the park blocks. Uh, and to that end, we got season tickets to the symphony, uh, joined a downtown uh, church, and, uh, and uh, got very involved in stuff going on in downtown Portland. We decided before we could sell our house, we had to fix it up. So we redid the kitchen and we put a deck on the back of it. And when we got all through, we said, boy, this is pretty comfortable. <laughs> Maybe we'll just stay here for a while. And about that time I got elected mayor and it was then pretty hard to move. Uh, and, and even now, quite frankly, uh, having been elected to this job as the guy who wasn't from Portland, uh, I kind of think that it would be uh, a problem for me if I then moved into Portland. You don't want to run for Portland mayor? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> you, you all have a mayor, and you have other people who quest after that job, and that's fine for me. <laughs> when, you, when you first ran, you ran as uh, the economic development candidate, and I, I wonder, given all of the changes in the region in the past few years, given how much more aware we are now of the lasting impact of the recession on income gaps, on affordability, has your definition of economic development changed? You know, the, the, the funny thing is it hasn't, and it, the unfortunately, that's, that's the good news and the bad news, because we're still, I mean, we still have the same hurdles. We, the biggest hurdle that we have in terms of not in so much in terms of economic development, in terms of growing more jobs, but of having the impact of those jobs be felt by people who actually live here. The, the biggest problem we have is our education system. Uh, and I, I remain concerned about an education system, not just the Portland, not just Portland public, but, but statewide, regionwide, certainly, that consistently fails communities of color and creates uh, an achievement gap at the very moment when those communities of color are in the process of becoming the majority of the kids in the school. Uh, and uh, if that gap continues to stay where it is and those demographics continue to apply, uh, we're going to be in a great deal of, we have a great deal of difficulty selling our workforce to any potential employer as a quality workforce that they can, where they can go and find kids who can 
do the jobs that they need to have done. So we need it. We really need to address the issue of, of education. And, uh, you know, it's it, my temptation, as with I think too many of us, is to say, you know, thank God that's somebody else's problem. Uh, but the reality is, is it is kind of all of our problem. And I think we all need to figure out how are we going to work together to solve that problem. So that, that's where we start. You know, the, the thing that I have changed a little bit on is, I mean, I used to believe that our economic prosperity depended on expanding the urban growth boundary, so we had lots of, lots of industrial land. We've got now a 50-year uh, supply of land designated an urban reserve, and there's only one 100-acre site outside the urban growth boundary right now that would be suitable for, for industrial growth. So expanding the urban growth boundary is not the way we're going to have, we're going to increase our land supply and improve our economic position. It's, ha it's going to have to be investing in infrastructure, doing brownfield remediation, uh, doing wetlands media mediation, remediation, uh, and, and consolidating ownerships to make those areas that are already in the urban growth boundary shovel ready and ready to go. I want to ask you how you pay for education fixes, but that's another Friday forum, I think. Uh, I am Anna Griffin with the Oregonian and OregonLive.com, and we are here at City Club's Friday Forum with Tom Hughes, Metro Council President. It is time now to open it up to the Q&A portion of the program. If you have a written question on an index card, hold it up very high so City Club staff can get to it. We're going to take questions from the audience. As always, City Club invites members to the microphone to ask their questions. Asking questions at the Friday Forum mic is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your questions in 30 seconds or less, and we'll get to at least one index card question. So can they ask, can they ask questions of either of us? Or? You're the one in the hot seat here. <laughs> this question is directed towards President Hughes. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm Jason Miner, City Club member and executive director of 1000 Friends of Oregon. You referenced the housing preference survey and market forces and a lot of things to which the region reacts in looking at the urban growth boundary. I'm interested in what can you do in your leadership role at Metro to proactively advance the 2040 vision, a very powerful vision that too often the city of Portland bears the brunt of carrying, trying to build density along corridors and centers, a beautiful part of that vision. What can Metro do as a leader to further the 2040 goal or 20, to further the 2040 vision and to, in your leadership role, get us to a place where in 2018 we're celebrating a doubleheader of two uh, urban growth boundary decisions in which there's no expansion. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I, you know, I, I, first of all, I, I think that, the, that the, the, the idea that Portland bears the brunt of the 2040 plan as it is developed is, uh, is, a, is a Portland view. Uh, one of the things that has intrigued me uh, over the time is that almost every community uh, in the Portland metropolitan area has developed a 2040 plan or, or a comp plan that is very much consistent with the 2040 plan. And we've seen a, a number of places where uh, they, have, uh, th they have begun to really develop those plans. We, we spend uh, quite a bit of money and uh, construction excise tax money. Uh, to promote uh, uh, to promote planning that is uh, 2040 sensitive planning, and I, I, I think that we've done uh, a, a fair amount to promote that in all jurisdictions. Port, you know, Portland gets the brunt. Portland's the the central city, and so it's where uh, on our plan the bulk of the growth is going to come. Uh, but if you look at the, and again, <laughs> my other experiences with Hillsboro, uh, two thirds of the Two thirds of the of the population growth of Hillsboro uh, over the lifetime of the West Side light rail has been in light rail stations, uh, clustered around light rail stations and along corridors. Uh, even when they expanded, as they just did out in North Hill, or South Hillsboro, uh, for a residential area, it was designated as a town center so that it could be planned and developed as a 2040 center. So you know, I think the message of 2040 is around the biggest problem that we have, and <clears throat> Michael Jordan uh, articulated it very well as, before he left to go to the state, uh, and that is that we do not have, you know, we've got 
$20 billion worth of investments to make in order to make 2040 a reality, and we will not have uh, anywhere close to that kind of money available to invest in infrastructure. So part of it is going to be a constant drumbeat towards figuring out a way to get the infrastructure uh, financing that we need to promote that. And I'm not willing to, I'm not willing yet to say that we'll not expand in, <laughs> but. Let me ask one from an index card, Tom, because this, uh, this follows up on the comments you made when we were talking about the public schools and equity. How has equity, especially for people of cover, color in poverty, been considered in recent growth boundary policy discussions? Well, we certainly considered it in terms of, uh, it was considered sort of tangentially, I think, in, in many respects. We've We've been struggling with our role in bringing a, a equity to the region, and and uh, there are some, and I think struggling actually to still try to understand what land use planning decisions, uh, how land use planning decisions affect communities of color and the distribution of of, uh, of racial diversity and poverty around the region. Uh, you know, one of the things that has happened here, and I used to attribute it a little bit to the uh, urban growth boundary, uh, is that uh, poverty has now been pretty evenly spread to the suburbs. Uh, uh, so uh, Portland has a level of, uh, of people in need of, of uh, housing, but so do Hillsborough, Beaverton, Gresham, and all of the, all of the suburban communities. Um, I'm not as sure that that's true anymore because it, it seems to be happening in every urban urban area in the country. So I, I don't know, I mean, I, we have, we are in the, we are now beginning to consider equity in every decision we make, uh, but I've never heard a good case made for uh, expansion or not expansion affecting the communities of color. Let's take one from the microphone. Thank you. Greg DiLoretto, a City Club member. So how is the fact that the Damascus area, uh, not living up to the expectation that it would develop, uh, affect the urban growth boundary conversation? An interesting, interesting history. When the, when the history of Damascus is written, it will be a very short book. Uh, <laughs> but it will be uh, an interesting book. And I think part of that uh, part of what's happening in Damascus, it reminds us again that when Damascus was designated as for urban growth boundary expansion, it was not a city. Uh, and, and part of what has happened in Damascus that has prevented its development is that rules have been enacted uh, by the city that prevent it from creating the sort of planning tools that you need in order to do development. Uh, that said, and so there has been an argument that we just should say, well, Damascus isn't going to develop for the next 20 years, take it out altogether. But the legislature, in their infinite wisdom, created a process by which citizens in Damascus who owned property could de-annex from Damascus and annex to Happy Valley and move their property into a place that was able and willing to develop it. Uh, there is an election coming up next year, I believe it is, maybe next May, uh, to uh, disincorporate the city of, of Damascus. At that point in time, then I think the development of the land that's in the urban growth boundary, uh, the bulk of it will then come under the, the rules of Clackamas County, and some people may actually annex to either Gresham or uh, or Happy Valley in order to develop. So I think a lot more of that is going to develop than we would have said two years ago, for example, but not as much as they thought when they first brought it in back uh, almost 20 years ago. <clears throat> uh, and I think there's a whole portion of it that may never, may never develop, but certainly not without uh, a substantial amount of investment on infrastructure. Let's take one more question from the microphone. My name is Katherine Nikolovsky. I'm a City Club member. Uh, so one focus of this conversation surrounds the link between the urban growth boundary, uh, the price of land and real estate prices. 
Oregon Metro maintains the regional land information system, which uh, our list database contains quite a rich amount of data that could help shed light on the complexities of the urban, uh, of our urban environment. I'm wondering if someone were to be interested to do more research and actually look at some of the link between real estate value and how um, land is being valued as we start to expand the urban growth boundary, is that easy to find information? Yeah, I'm getting a nod from the people up here who know. Uh, I, I'm not, I mean, I, it wouldn't be easy if you called me and said, can you, can you go find that for me? Uh, but if you did call me and say, could you go find that for me, I would direct you to somebody who could go find that for you and let you know how to hook, hook into that. I, I think that that might be interesting research to look at. So. Do we have one more question from the microphone? Hi, Claire Dennerlin, Manson City Club member. Um, I'm going to shine the spotlight a little bit on one of our sponsors today. And we know that land rates definitely account for some portion of housing prices and housing values, but roughly 20% in some of the mixes I've seen. Given that the system of Airbnb has allowed homeowners to garner so much more money than, say, a longer term or more traditional rental, and that it's also more flexible, and that do you see, or at least that these rates could maybe signal to real estate speculators to redevelop an area, cause rental increases in a more overt way? And do you think that these rates can be an indicator of future displacement within incredibly popular pressurized urban areas? See, you, you, I thought you told me there wouldn't be any math. That's, <laughs> uh, OK. Um, I think that what we're seeing in terms of the price, and this is not going to answer your question because I'm not sure I altogether understood your question, but uh, I, I think that what's happening in terms of, uh, of the rental increases is that you've got a 2% vacancy rate. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, for part of that is because for about five years, nobody built any apartments. Uh, and for a while before that, they were building condos because, uh, and so making the conversion from condo over to, to apartment has not, has not been as easy as possible. Uh, I, I just think that, that at some point in time, and you know, part of the thing is these things, it's not a steady curve, it's a up and down. So, you know, five years from now, we may be talking about all those empty apartments around and, and the rent, rental prices will come down, but, uh, but if if that's true, then they'll go they'll go back up again. But right now, there's I, I I've never seen the apartment mar market as hot as it is now. I'm sorry. I have one more question from an index card from a very well informed guest. While I receive the Metro monthly newsletters, I would suspect that four out of five residents are completely uninformed of Metro's duty. They cite running the zoo, building the convention center, hotel running the convention center. What can you do to better educate the electorate? And I think I would add to that, do you think your constituents understand what Metro is? No. Uh, in fact, we not, not only don't I think that, I think we have polling data over the years that indicate that it's true. I mean, I, 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 I've tried appearing half nude on the Willamette Week cover. I've tried uh, uh, appearing in the Tribune as a, as a garden gnome. Uh, think, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much more I could do to attract attention to Metro. Not that I think that necessarily explains what we do, uh, but it might lead people to say, what does this guy do? Uh, and uh, I've, not, I've not really found that that happens. It's a, part of it is that what we do is right around the edges of the wonky nature of government. Uh, other than running the zoo, which is about as unwonky as you can get, and even running the zoo has a whole wonky side that nobody wants to know much about. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it is just difficult to do that. I, I was on the Hillsborough City Council when we did our comprehensive plan. We had 64 public hearings on our comprehensive plan, and we had 69 people total showed up at those 64 public hearings, and 64 of them were the same guy uh, <laughs> who had a parcel of land. And so, you know, I mean, it's, 
uh, it, people are interested in land use planning when it directly affects them. It's harder to get them involved when it's further out, the sort of visioning part. We have run out of time, broadcast time, for further questions, and we'll have to stop for today. I'd like to thank our moderator, Anna Griffin, from the Oregonian, Metro Councilor Tom Hughes, and the staff here at the Sentinel Hotel for their hard work in delivering the City Club luncheon.